To the European or Western mind, the expression oriental splendor probably conveys a range of things. It might convey gold, jewels, silks and spices, latticed windows, the Arabian nights, ivory palaces. What it probably doesn't convey though is a poor stable in Bethlehem in the first century in the time of Roman governorship, troubled political times. If there is an element of the nativity story which does ring a bit more of our common conception of oriental splendor, it's probably the visit of the Magi, so we'll come back to them later. But really, the point of today's antiphon, O Oriens, is precisely to make us challenge our view of what constitutes true splendor, true oriental splendor, the splendor of the rising sun. It's interesting to note that the Syriac churches use the same word to mean orient, that splendor of the rising sun, and to denote the epiphany. And we shouldn't forget either that the epiphany is an integral part of Christmas, Christmas isn't just about celebrating the nativity, the coming of our Lord in the flesh, but also his manifestation in the flesh to all nations. And so I'd like to think a little bit more about that today in particular, especially with the visit of those Magi who themselves come from the Orient. What does Matthew say about them? Not very much. Behold, Magi came from the Orient to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born King of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. It's interesting they asked this question to Herod, who's himself a king, appointed by the Romans and under their authority, but still a local ruler nonetheless. They've made a very great journey to get to Jerusalem, but it's not quite the end for them yet. They've made a very terrible journey and I think we can only begin to understand what that's like. Maybe we can a bit more this year with all of the difficulties that COVID has meant for travel, especially international travel. But let's bear in mind that for the Magi, this would have probably involved crossing from the Persian Empire into the Roman Empire. So probably not the easiest of journeys either. If that list that I began with, the oriental splendor of silk spices, gold, ivory, and so on, if those, and incense, if those were also expensive, it's precisely because it was so cost expensive and time expensive to, do, to make that journey from the east into the west. So what can we learn from the Magi? Well, they've made that journey precisely because they realize something about oriental splendor, which we so easily don't. They've come to worship the king of the Jews. They've come because they saw his star in the east. Now that's obviously a reference to the prophecy in Numbers, a prophecy by Balaam, who just like the Magi, is also a Gentile prophet. I'm not sure we could call the Magi prophets, but they're certainly wise men, and they put their trust in that star. The most insignificant of details, you might say, but they do it. And trust is so important for all of us. We don't realize it in our daily lives so often. We require that trust in people, in events, in facts, truths hard clung to. But all of that trust only makes sense if ultimately it becomes trust in God and in God's providence. And that is something which I think we can learn from them. After all, what I'm not recommending you start doing is start practicing astrology. I think the church wouldn't be very happy with me if I suggested that or with you if you started doing that. And if you need further convincing, let's just listen to what the prophet Isaiah has to say, who we've been reading in the divine office this season of Advent. Let them come forward now and save you. He's speaking to Babylon. These who analyze the heavens, who study the stars, and announce month by month what will happen to you next. But the truth is we don't know what happens to us next. 
It's all really part of God's providence. And providence is really what's guiding them through the star when they make their journey from the east to Jerusalem and eventually to Bethlehem. So we shouldn't imitate the Magi completely. There's another important way in which we shouldn't and arguably can't imitate the Magi. They make this great journey to come and visit God in the flesh, God made manifest to all nations. But we don't really, we can't make that journey. God isn't in Bethlehem anymore. He is still present with us every day in the Blessed Sacrament. So we do have his physical presence with us. But it's hardly a journey that we can make to him. Rather, it's a journey which he makes to us, just as is the one which he makes to us at Christmas. To us, the whole world, the church, and to each one of us individually. There used to be a brother in this community who some of you may know, who always used to be fond of saying that um, in Holy Communion, we don't receive Christ, rather he receives us. And I think there is something to that. It's absolutely right that we can too easily, by the simple words that we use, forget what we really mean by that great sacrament. But we shouldn't forget that although he receives us, he's also the one who makes the journey. He doesn't receive us like Elizabeth receives Mary at the end of her journey, or like Mary herself receives the Magi when they've made their long journey, or even the shepherds. Rather, it is Christ who comes to us. He comes to us as the Orient, the splendor of eternal light, the son of justice, as today's Antiphon says. Now, it's interesting. I mean, obviously, we've got the rising star, and we've got the star closest to us, the sun, are all being used as images to point towards Christ to only begin to show what Christ is like. And in particular, with the rising sun, we've got this image of the dawn. Now, why is the sun so interesting? Well, obviously, we know that when the sun rises in the morning, all it's done is appear, make itself manifest. That sense of epiphany again. Every day, the sun rises, we get to see it. There is new light upon the world. But the sun itself was already there, shining upon another part of the world. So the sun itself isn't new. It's the splendor of eternal light, that light which was there in the beginning, the light which, even the light at the beginning of Genesis, which is mentioned when God made the light, only begins to reflect. This is the eternal light of God, and particularly the eternal light of the divine word, which John speaks about. The coming of that light isn't always comfortable, it has to be said. We are, after all, sitting in the darkness and in the shadow of death. That particular phrase is interesting because we already heard it yesterday. It's one of the few bits in the Oantophons that's repeated from one day to the next, perhaps the only. And that's got to tell us something. Particularly this time, we're asking the rising sun to come and illumine us. That can be painful because sometimes the deepest darkness isn't the darkness that surrounds us. It can easily be the darkness that's within us. That isn't easy to accept, but part of what we do when we ask Christ to come and illumine the darkness, and especially illumine the darkness within us, is precisely to make light those parts of our lives which haven't always been so easy to accept which we can pray about, but in the end only offer to him. We shouldn't shrink away from the light simply because it reveals what sometimes we'd rather did remain hidden. Going back to the Magi then, what can we do to imitate them and in what ways should we not imitate them? Obviously, let's not practice astrology, as I've already said, but as well as not being able to make the journey to see Christ, we also need to note in the Epiphany story that the Magi in the end return to their own country. They've seen the Lord, they've worshipped him, they've given him their gifts of gold, incense, and myrrh, but eventually they make a return. 
We as Christians aren't called to do that. We are called to remain with Christ once we found him, to cling to him. We don't have our own country. Jesus Christ is our own country. Heaven is our country. If there is someone we should perhaps imitate more, especially in this time of Advent, it's of course, and can never be said too, much, too often, that great figure of John the Baptist, the one who in the wilderness prepares the way for the Lord, echoing those words of Isaiah, which themselves, of course, are reference to that royal road, which was built on the same way which the Magi themselves used to go to Jerusalem. So let's be rather like John the Baptist, clearing the path from all of those obstacles, preparing the way for the light to come, making sure that everything is there, even those things which we would not rather see, so that there is no shadow when the light does eventually come. That way, perhaps, we can, this Advent, prepare for Jesus when he comes, a fitting home in the lowly stable of our hearts.